Hallo und herzlich willkommen am Telestammtisch. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and happy new year to everybody. I am joined here today by writer and director Liam O'Donnell. Hi, Donnell. Hi, how are you? Hi, Liam. I'm fine. I hope you too. I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, very excited to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. I'm honored to have you here and hope you started the year right. I feel I feel pretty good so far. I'm actually, you know, kind of excited to get back to work and, and start uh, making some new stuff. All right. New stuff on your current movie, Skylines, or you already got uh, something different you're working on? Something different. It's been um, it's been basically, you know, we finished Skylines in October. So it's been almost two and a half, almost three months of just hype, you know, and like press and and, uh, and talking about that movie. And um, and now that mm -hmm. it's out and seeing people's reactions, it's exciting to uh, to kind of make something new. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been fun, but it's also it, it kind of worked out well where it's like, OK, it's 2021 time to time to keep it moving, you know? Yeah, that's right. I would like to start uh, with a short introduction of you because our German audience, I think, isn't uh, well, doesn't know you that good. So I'd say, I'd say most audiences don't know me that good, but that's that's uh, OK. Yeah, let's do it. That's uh, the reason we're here, left, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your first steps uh, in this business. What was the reason you started making movies? Was it a, a particular moment you realized, I will make movies? How did you start? Um, no, it's, it's interesting because um, sometimes I, it's almost like you, you tell the story so many times that you, you can lose the way because it is your whole life, really. Um, but yeah, I was, I think I was like a lot of kids who saw, um, stuff like Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park and were like, oh, I really want to, you know, get involved in that sort of magic. I think seeing those, the, the new era of visual effects were, you know, definitely had an impact on me. And I was kind of like aimless in college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, I liked politics. I did an internship down in Washington, D.C. And mm -hmm. my uncle, <coughs> uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, was a chief of staff for a senator for a, a number of years. And he ended up, he was a writer uh, uh, kind of part-time at the same time. So he ended up working on the West Wing. And he had a TV show that was filming after the West Wing that was set in the Senate with Josh Brolin. The same time I was doing an internship down in DC. So I visited a set for the first time at like 20 years old. And it was just them kind of filming something on location, like a walk and talk, you know, very West mm -hmm. Wing sort of thing. And I think that was kind of like the, like, Oh, it's like a job. You know, I think, I think that would just seeing a bunch of people and then, um, you know, your uncle's like the showrunner. And you, you you get say hi to Josh Brolin, which again, this is 2002. Josh Brolin is before, the whole like career renaissance, like cable Thanos thing, you know? So mm -hmm. he's, uh, you know, he was still very much known by the Goonies. And I, I asked him about the Goonies and I could see his eyes roll. <laughs> he was like, this fucking kid is <laughs> talking to me about the Goonies. Uh, but you know, so that was, that was just like, um, like a weekend for this. I was down there for probably three, three and a half, four months, but I think just that kind of as a seed in my head of like, Oh, it's a job. Um, And, uh, and I think the show ended up getting canceled after a season. Um, but it, it was this kind of moment of, of seeing, you know, obviously someone I knew, but also just a bunch of people working really hard and, and filming something that felt like tangible in a strange way. Um, so when I finished college, I, I, I had taken some screenwriting courses at Boston University and I, I, I was interested in it, but I, I kind of felt like I was just dipping my toes. So I decided I was going to go out there for a year. I deferred uh, going to law school or entertainment law was one thing I thought about um, and and went to, to L.A. for a year 
And my brother, uh, was about four, actually five years, five, six years older than me. He, he was an actor and he had just booked a play in downtown LA and they put him up in one of these places called the Oakwoods, which is like a, an apartment for like two weeks. So I had like a two week landing pad on a couch and my best friend, um, from, from high school who was, a a motion graphics artist, he wanted to go too. So we both, he got like an air mattress and I stayed on the couch and then, you know, we found an apartment and I think it helped coming out here with a friend a lot, you know, cause my brother ended up coming back once the play was done. But, um, me and my friend, he was such a talented, um, concept designer, filmmaker, director now on his own, right. And uh, so having someone else who could make connections and we'd be friends with, it was like, you're doubling, doubling the ground in a, in, in a way. Mm-hmm. So um, we both ended up working at like this pothead production company that paid us like in burritos and marijuana <laughs> and, um, and just like watching movies and, and like, you know, our rent was, we each needed to come up with like $620 a month. So it was like, and we Not could much. Sur- we could survive off of nothing, yeah. So it wasn't the hardest um, thing to make men's meet. Like I would take jobs as like um, a telemarketer and like work for like three weeks and, and get that paycheck and then just leave because I, I couldn't take it. So it'd be like whatever I could do to get through each month, um, mm. start out. And then it wasn't that long afterwards that we ended up meeting the Strauss brothers because one of the guys at that production company used to work for them. And, um, they needed, they had so many people working for them, um, that they needed someone to do this extra treatment that had been sent their way from eBay, China. And so I'd already talked to them, like pitch the movie ideas and stuff. And they were like, okay, like, you're not like a complete moron. You can kind of write and come up with ideas. So they kind of gave Matthew, um, my roommate and I like, this pitch like hey or you do the concepts you write the pitch and when 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 you get like um a commercial pitch it's like usually a bunch of storyboards and um some artwork and 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 a write up and they're like this is what we want to do you know make it better pretty much so that was uh that was my first um job from from the Strauss brothers which we didn't end up getting but they liked the the package and they liked the writing so the next job was a Fresca commercial, which was like a whole campaign. And we ended up booking that. And, uh, and then I got to go on set with them and it was like a bunch of like beautiful ballerinas, like inside of a Fresca can. And so they were like <laughs> all on wires and it was just all green screen photography, just kind of like camera moves on green with women on wires doing that. And then you put them into the bubbles of the Fresca all in, in post. So that was my first, you know, real being on set in LA, you know, once I, as soon as I got out there, we had been like filming cable commercials and, and, um, short films and kind of helping out on, on other people's productions as much as we could and started to kind of figuring out filming our own stuff. But that was my first, like, Oh, this is a real production. You know, I did, I PA'd for a few commercials. I was terrible at it. I crashed a truck full of fake snow. I got no fender bender. (laughs) I just was like, I, I, all I, I'm the type of person that was like, how do I get to the front of the line? <laughs> I was like, like I'm so bad at 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 uh, at sitting here, uh, and I just was staring at Video Village. Like that looks like the place I would like to be. Um, so yeah, that, that that's all the that's all the minutia of the of the early days. And um, but pretty much, you know, after we booked that that Fresca job. And then a bunch of bookings came pretty quick after that with music videos and commercials. And I just like stay, I just showed up to their office every day. I was just like, just came there, work with them and then be like, you want to go for a walk and just pitch them movie ideas. And um, eventually, uh, you know, they, they liked one of the ideas that I came up with, which was uh, sort of a black hole on earth disaster movie. You know, I love Armageddon and deep impact and movies like that. So that was actually one of the, the the first script that I ever wrote for them was a big um, disaster movie. And I was starting that when um, AVP two came over their desks and they, they were always getting scripts, you know, to, to direct. Mm-hmm. They, they hadn't done a movie yet, but um, you know, they'd done a bunch of huge music videos and, um, and commercials. So, so they were always up for stuff. And um, 
and that was one that um you know we're such huge huge alien predator fans and me the the brothers obviously and and then matthew santoro as well my friend so he was doing all the concepts and i was writing out their pitch packet and uh we'd be watching the movies like on repeat in the office and it was one of those those pitches that got pushed like a bunch of times so we did these all nighters cramming and we felt like we had it ready and then they'd be like oh it's not till next week so then we had another week to cram so it just kept getting kind of better and better um and so by the time they walked in i guess uh you know they just they just crushed it and then we had this job and so the the then the the real lucky thing was that they were like well you know you worked so hard on this and you you've you've been such a good sounding board we'd like you to come on set and so they 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 flew me up and i stayed at uh, an apartment across the street from them for all of production and um it was kind of you know just just kind of like an assistant slash consultant where um you know and it was an interesting studio filmmaking lesson because this is like a 40 million dollar fox studio movie um but like there were so many it was it was hard to make decisions you know we we feel like we'd have something in really good shape like a previs for there's a big sewer set piece in the first half of that movie and we had this really cool kind of cat and mouse thing with like motion trackers and and him kind of like the the predator is kind of herding all the aliens into this one part and he's going to slaughter them all and um the studio was like well they don't actually fight though like there's no hand-to-hand fight and we're like well like you know you can't really like hand-to-hand fight with an alien you you die <laughs> and they're like that's right and they, and they were like no no that, that's not gonna work it's not it's not enough an action scene so like at the last second you know like we're shooting it the next day and they changed the scene and we thought we had everything kind of working well so that was me i had i came up with the like well you know they the the aliens tackle him he comes under and he comes up with them in his arms and all these alien fans were like no the predator can't (laughs) hold aliens out like that it was like yeah i mean i'm sure if i had another day to think about it we could have come up with something better but that's one of those things that um we'd had a month to think about the other sequence and it was all working like clockwork and was quite clever. And then they just say no. And you're like, fuck, I got to come up with something else. So that was an interesting uh, like trial by fire sort of thing. And, and, and me not having any real skin in the game, you know, I could just kind of be, I'd be either in the trailer or like next to them on set and going back and forth. Cause the previs artist was in the trailer working on like this big alienware setup so he was doing the previs for them and be making notes for like whatever the sequence was and it was frustrating for them because um the the second unit shot all of the alien and predator stuff so it's like you feel like you're making this dream come true movie and it's really just you doing all these kind of like diner scenes Uh, (laughs) that's not that fun enough (laughs) with all these actors you know i was like i was like wait i thought i was making an alien versus predator movie it's like no no, the second unit's making the alien versus predator movie you have to film all these diner scenes um so yeah that was that was an interesting um experience and that was definitely like like film school like daniel pearl was the dp who is is incredible um but just kind of seeing all the dynamics um and and like the the very end the end of that movie like the whole rooftop stuff in the draft that we got it was very simple like they just went up on the chopper and and the town blew up and so that that was really like all the stuff that i got to build out with with them and make more of of the set piece and um make sure that the two creatures fought at the end like i i thought that was crazy that there was no there was no actual fight scene. Uh, Not enough in the movie. I would no. love to see more of them. Yeah, well, but even getting them, I mean, in the, literally in the draft, we got the Pred Alien died on page three. It was like, wait, what? And then regular warrior aliens were the ones impregnating women. And we were like, this is crazy. It was, it was just a crazy experience because I felt like you guys are the guys that make Alien and Predator movies. Why are we telling you what they can and can't do? There were so many strange... <laughs> things like that that just seemed like they they just literally didn't care and uh it was all just about you know whatever's new and shocking um so it was uh it was a very a, a very educational experience and obviously getting to be up like on a movie set for that long 
and uh and really loving it and it's fucking an alien and predator movie you know like the um ian uh white who played the predator in that um just just seeing him in the suit uh you know on set for the first time was one of those like uh you know pinch me type of moments um but yeah and i got to meet alec gillis and, and tom woodruff jr of, of, of amalgamated dynamics and um and see kind of up close how practical effects worked um so that relationship went on to um to the first skyline as well as that you know we went to them for the creature design and skyline so this skyline right this skyline yeah so i think one watched of the it reasons, in the cinemas thank you i think one of the reasons why the creatures are so well designed in that movie is like the tanker like amalgamated dynamics did a full maquette of that like a clay maquette so we have this big clay sculpture of it that then was laser scanned in to create the asset so there's just a lot of detail and a lot of kind of handmade feel to some of those creatures. They they designed all of them in the first movie, even though there was no practical effects. Um, we still kind of had that um, elevated creature design, and so those that that tanker design is the one that lasted all three movies. And um, so yeah, so that for is, for a, for a good reason, is if I may say, yeah, because the design of the aliens uh, was. If you ask me, one of the highlights in the first thing, uh, first movie, because the aliens look very unique. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, that's that's kind of. Um, I think that I think that in the ships and the in the lights is like it has its it has its flavor, and um, and that that really carved it out. But yeah, so after AVP R, so that was two thousand seven. Um, then yeah, it was, it was, I was writing scripts and we we're trying to get things set up, but I think everything I was writing was too big budget. And, and that's where skyline kind of was this perfect mix between something we could film cheaply, but use a lot of visual effects on. Um, and so when, when we came up with that pitch, it, it happened really, really fast. It was just sort of like, okay, let's go, let's, let's do this. Um, And I think that was because we were kind of sitting around for two years, you know, it was like two years after that, we'd had a bunch of cool jobs, worked on, you know, Usher and 50 Cent music videos and stuff like that. But, you know, obviously we wanted to get back into movies. So once the the genesis of that thing came together and we knew we could film it ourselves um, with pretty cheaply, it was like, just go, 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 go. And, uh, and then... Man, I mean, we were we were in post um, for like a month. I think we'd finished filming in in March 2009. No, sorry, March 2010. And then, like in April, we sold it. Um, we just showed Relativity the ending um, on the rooftop, and they were like, "Okay, yeah, we'll buy that." And uh, <laughs> and then uh, I, they were. It was just because I think feel like it was like all these things kind of lined up with with the way Comic Con was at the time. And um, and where relativity was kind of that they they wanted to make a big splash. So, man, they 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 really did. You know, they bought this huge billboard and and they they did these like foam people that were floating up into the air over the whole uh, San Diego. So, yeah, it was it was it was really a wild ride to go from, you know, shooting a pitch trailer in November of 2009 um, at Greg's apartment you know, with his um, sister's girlfriend and one of our buddies, just kind of like, okay, this is a bunch of weird stuff. Like I was holding the boom for the pitch trailer and every, it was like a crew of like four people. And then, um, you know, six months later, or, you know, it's, it's at relativity and, and we're planning this huge comic-con push. It was just like, you know, it was, it was definitely a, that, that dream come true sort of uh, vibe. And it's crazy because uh, now it is 10 years later and it's still happening. <laughs> How times uh, went, right? Yeah. Where yeah. is the time? Yeah, I know. It's nuts. Right, right. So the next movie uh, was uh, Portals or was it The Bay? Because I have The Bay here. You also worked on, right? Did you write it or what no, exactly? No, no. Did... Okay, so The Bay... Um... 
One of the producers of Skyline is Brian Kavanaugh Jones, who mm-hmm. um, was at uh, CAA and he left to start his own production company. Um, and he's very, he's a very smart guy. Um, his, his production company is called Automatic. And he, um, so he, he, he EP'd Skyline, um, EP'd Take Shelter, Jeff Nichols, Take Shelter and um in the bay and the bay you know was a very low budget found footage movie that needed visual effects um help okay. as an investment same as take shelter so both those movies um he came to us uh, at hydraulics and basically you know for us to do the visual effects as as an investment in the movie he kind of had okay. lost to be, to become producers. Um, and so, um, I didn't actually have anything to do really with any of it, except that I read the script for the Bay and I said, I fucking love this and you guys have to do it. And so he, he, as a thank you, uh, to me, um, uh, Brian gave me a co-producing credit on the Bay because the brothers were kind of like, Oh, you know, like it's, it's not exactly the greatest business model to do, visual effects uh for free um but yeah, it was like right. but uh it wasn't a ton you know it was all the, these little crab critter stuff and um the original draft i gotta say was was a darker than the movie it was very night right. of the, very night of the living dead and it was okay. very much just like um just meant to horrify you for how you know <laughs> shitty the the this country treats you know the environment and and regulations and it really was this sort of just like gut punch and uh i just had my first child at the time and i just remember reading the the last page of it and being like oh like absolutely you know horrified and i was like this is this is scary not in a it was scary in an existential way, you know, like, oh, this is this is really the bad shit that could happen to us. It's not like a fucking boogeyman under my stairs. This is like, you know, the, if 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 people aren't looking out for each other and aren't following regulations, you know, disasters can happen. Um, so I just felt I felt really strongly about it and um, and wanted wanted them to be a part of it. And so that that's really it was just from being being a champion, I guess, of the project over at Hydraulic. <laughs> Well, I gotta say, it's uh, nice uh, that they made the movie because I really like found footage movies like Cloverfield, Chronicle, Blair Witch Project. Yeah. And if you ask me, there are not enough movies uh, made as a found footage because that's very special. But they're hard. I guess you know, not we, everybody we, likes it. We tried to make one. We made one um, after uh, after Skyline. Um, before beyond skyline we did we did a really low budget found footage movie um that was sort of like about it was called chimera and it was about um you know being able to film dreams you know record dreams and so then when Mm -hmm. when you go into the dream footage it would be like movies in the middle of the found footage um but the rules and like the vocabulary was were interesting and frustrating and um you know, so I, I tip my hat to anybody who can really make those work. You know, it was one of those things where I felt like um, the movie ended up, we ended up not getting finished because it felt like it, it wasn't everything to everyone, but it probably, I think it, it, I think it was, it was pretty good at what it did, but um, you know, people, the people involved had different, uh, you know, versions of it and it ended up just not finishing. But uh, to me, what I found to be, um you know, really, really <laughs> challenging was the grammar of it. And even stuff like, you know, when I started, I, it, I, I was just the producer and uh, of that one. I, I didn't, didn't write, didn't direct or anything, but I was just, just even as a producer and, and, and consulting on the edits was like the jump cutting within a scene, you know, to pace things up. Sometimes it works. And sometimes you just feel like it's totally fake and it, it, it breaks the, breaks everything and you know and it it feels that way when you watch other people's too you know sometimes it's like it oh yeah that that jump cut totally because because when you're filming it it's like 
you don't realize when you're watching movies like how sped up everything is. Um, yeah. You know, like the reason why they're covering all those angles is that so that the person can get in and out of the room in a second and a half, but film it found footage and it takes five seconds and it's fucking boring. So it's like, uh, there's, there's just a lot of different things like that, that, um, that I, I was like, man, it, it's no joke. So when, when you see someone do it really, really well, um, like the ones you you suggested like yeah i mean cloverfield is just like insane it's insane how how well they did that one um yeah it's i definitely i definitely have a lot of respect for that yeah maybe sometime you will make a fun footage movie no i tried i, I was involved <laughs> that was it i got my taste and i was like no no not I, again no because in my favorite part uh even as a producer on that were the dreams because then it was back into real movie grammar mm -hmm. and um yeah i mean the thing I, i i feel like i'm moving more towards um like more traditional stylized like film coverage than where i started which is starting very like run and gun handheld steady cam and then on in the latest movie it was like i used like way more dolly than i'd ever used before and way more close-ups than i'd ever done before and uh i really okay. enjoyed that i really felt like it's subtle stuff but um i felt like it it bumped the emotion uh the emotional reaction up a lot more in the movie whereas like um i i, I had a lot of wides and mediums in uh in in beyond skyline which worked great but there was there's a couple of different places where i felt like i should have had better tighter close-ups on the actors for more emotional reactions and i felt like i got that in skyline okay well uh, you already named the movie beyond skyline yeah let's get to that topic i love that i love that, that steelbook cover it's so crazy um, me too yeah and then uh, on the back it's his head right it's just the face uh, right? yeah it's uh the ship at the end oh okay Wait a second. so Wow. It's the last scene of the movie, but the inside, if you ask me, looks even better because you are inside of the spaceship. You see that? Yes. No, no, no. That, that it's the disc that I was talking about. Uh, it's based on the disc. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The that, disc, yeah. The, on the, the shot. On yeah. the disc, it's his face. Yeah. Right. And the design alone uh, made me buy the movie because it really looks awesome. And as you can see in the background, I'm a big collector of movies. Got a lot of other collectibles, uh, yes. Predator head, Alien head over there, a lot of stuff. What should I Too show many. You? I'll show you the. This is a. This is a uh, a skull from Skylines. Ah, oh, awesome! Holy crap! This was signed by <laughs> everybody in the uh, in the crew. And I hadn't oh my this, god i hadn't opened this since i got back from lithuania and so i just opened it this morning to show you and i was like it's very very heartwarming this looks so damn awesome oh man so yeah we have a bunch of these in the movie but unfortunately they didn't read that well on camera so i did put a dead alien with them but there's a scene where you kind of there's there's supposed to be a bunch of dead uh pilots But yeah, this okay. is this is definitely there's a cool drawing of this too that we had on all of our uh, our cast stuff that oh, I, I should really just I should really just man up and get a tattoo of it. <laughs> you 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 should rather produce a, a few more and sell them. God, I would kill oh. to get one of those. Oh wait, let me get you the the toy that you you liked, which um, unfortunately I broke the arm off of when I was moving the statue. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, my poor my poor pilot and his because it, it kind of wiggles on the base and the arm popped off. But uh, this okay. was just a, this was a 3D print that okay. uh, that our visual effects supervisor uh, Thomas Loader from Cologne um made this sort of as a surprise because he obviously got the assets for the pilot and then was like these are cool i'm just going to print a, a 3d version so, oh man 
even uh, broken, I would give you a few hundred dollars for that oh, just stop. to have it in my collection. Oh, stop. <laughs> oh, uh, I, looks awesome, man. Yeah. But, no, it's funny. It's it also, it always sounds like German people want the collecting items. I don't know why, but you guys like, you, you definitely have an appreciation for sci-fi design. It's definitely absolutely. I, I don't. I don't hear it as much from the different uh, different territories. Although you know, I did just get um, that that double feature uh, Blu-ray of of Skyline and Beyond. Um, yeah, I think it sold pretty well in Germany. Um, helps with my Christmas shopping. I did get a check. Hey, <laughs> awesome! <laughs> so uh, nice to hear that. Yeah. Uh, so, oh yeah. So you were saying about. Um, so just about beyond skyline in general. So yeah, that I, I was kind of hinting at it earlier with about um, you know working with Tom and Alec and, and practical effects, and then the story for part two, you know, had just a lot more of the alien being a character and being on screen, and the design, mm-hmm. the design of the the pilot at the end of part one is like super seed. <clears throat> super you know even his skin is like translucent and glowing and it was like there's just no way that we could really do it that way um and it was also sort of like it th- that design was was something for a slightly variant idea that felt <laughs> like it was too bug-like and like really really hor- horrifying to me um in a way that 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 was going to be tough for what we needed to emotionally do and be on skyline. So I was like, okay, we used kind of like, like the back is very similar still here. This is still similar to the first movie and the kind of silhouette was similar, but we definitely went in a more predator vibe to be a little bit more heroic so that the, the design, what I think is great about this design is that it's flexible and we use it kind of in, in both, both of my movies is that it can be a hero or a villain. And when it's a hero, you're like, that guy's kind of cool. And when it's a villain, that guy's kind of (laughs) scary. So I think that's really tricky. Um, And the the designer's name was uh, Keith Christensen, who was recommended to me by our practical effects supervisor and creator on, um, who created the pilots and the shepherd. And then the matriarch and the new one, Alan Holt. He had worked with Keith a bunch and he's like, he's, this guy's the best in the business. And um, so he, uh, he really nailed this in, 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 in kind of short order. And um, so that was sort of from the, from the alien design thing, that was the big change in, in beyond skyline. And like I was saying, like my, I felt like my approach to that movie was very much like super ambitious, run and gun, very stubborn. And I was like, I really um, wanted everything to be as authentic as possible. I was like pushing to get these locations. I wanted to film in actual subway tunnels. I wanted to film in actual uh, <laughs> temples and, um, and it's fairly uncompromising about it. And uh, luckily, you know, we ended up getting all those different things. I mean, the fact that we actually were in that UNESCO temple site in, in, in Jojo was, was absolutely insane. Um, but that, that's kind of the, some of the reactions for skylines where it's like, it was all, it was a much more efficient, uh, shorter shoot because skyline beyond skyline was almost like six months production. Um, we did have to break up in the middle, um, for Frank to do another movie called Stephanie for Blumhouse. Um, so that's why it wasn't like we were shooting for six months, but it was a long shoot. And, and just even doing that of like breaking for months, then coming back and, and trying to like keep everyone's head in the same movie, I think yeah. is one of the, you know, there's many reasons why it feels like three movies, but that's one of them. Cause I feel like we shot all of the, the Asia stuff first. And so that, that to me, one of the reasons why I think it's the best part of the movie aside from how exciting it is to have eco and Yayan and, and these really cool sets in the bunkers and these really great fights and everything is that like, everyone was kind of there together for this like month and a half in Indonesia, like, you know, we're really believing and working on this movie. 
Um, and so like the energy and the passion and everything is just, it, it, that was the best level. But when you're now like coming back <laughs> five months later and you're like in Toronto on like a subway platform with the trains coming up, it was just like, let's just get this and get the hell out of here. So I felt like, um, I felt like that was, there were some lessons that I, that I internalized on that, on how to, you know, keep, keep the energy and the stamina and, and everybody's focus, you know together for <clears throat> the the length of a shoot yeah well Iku is my absolute highlight of the second movie because that guy knows how to do action he know how to kill people well seeing him is always awesome frank rillo obviously a great actor but no Iku Uva is one of my favorite actors those last years yeah, well, no, I agree. And I think, I think Eco is like, um, he's like still like, he's still underrated. It's still like, it doesn't seem like people know how good he is. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I hope, I, I hope people like, you know, like I, I really tried to make it feel like this dude was like an icon of cinema. And I tried to make it like, that was my approach to him is like, keep him with this helmet on, it's like, mm -hmm. like everything was like a slow reveal and that like you should be looking at this person with a certain awe and respect and um, and never kind of um, really even making him feel like second fiddle to anybody. And that, that that's what I think is really cool about the movie is that like you meet this guy halfway through and then like within 20 minutes, he's like the hero of his own movie on the side. And like he's got his <laughs> own fights with the aliens and you're like totally rooting for him. And I don't think you, you can't really do that with any with with you know an actor who's not who doesn't have that star presence doesn't have that charisma. And that yeah. was that was the lesson of of Skylines was like if we're gonna do this B plot on Earth, we need a Rona Mitra to be the the the, the hero of that because like she could be the star of our own movie. So if you're gonna cut to this person and they're gonna have their own fights and their own scenes, like you really need someone who is is a is a movie star in their own right and that that you're gonna like you know follow down that road so yeah that that, that to me that was eco well and you also gotta see i don't know how to speak the name yaya ruayan who yeah. also joins the fight at the end who we also know from the raid well i was really surprised when i saw him because i didn't expect him but he also joined the yeah. head and delivered just like the rest of the cast. So, <laughs> yeah, I love you. I love you, Ayan. And 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 uh, and he he comes back in Skylines, even though he was brutally murdered in Beyond Skyline. We put him back oh, together yeah. again. We put him back together again. Well, I can't wait to see the third uh, movie, Skylines. But we in Germany, we don't have a release date. We don't know anything when we're gonna see it. Uh, I guess you I, I can't know. say it's, anything about that. No, I, 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 I would, I would think it would be sometime within, um, 2021. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting, um, I'm not super involved in the, in the foreign sales, you know, they, they kind of come to me when they need things. Um, mm -hmm. but they don't, I'm, I'm not involved in like talking to buyers and, and figuring out release dates. Um, but when they need a sizzle reel or stuff like that, then then they call me. Um, well, uh, <laughs> you can say them. Uh, Germany is waiting for the movie day. Yeah, no, I, the, I, I, think, I think it would be. I think it would be this year. Um, I think. I think it, like you're saying, it it, it it seems to make sense. Like it would be, um, you know, on Blu-ray. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll see. There's. Um, I, I I would love to see it. You know, kind of get a get get a whole proper worldwide release within this year because um i think you know that it's it, 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 it it's it's unfortunate that there's all these different timings and releases and i see everyone kind of it complaining is. about it on facebook but it's really out of my hands you know it's like it's um you know you're I, you're just kind of lucky that um you're getting any type of release on anything nowadays let alone you know coordinated worldwide True. release so i hope you know, I hope it all kind of comes in short order, but 
it's 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 not really up to me unfortunately yeah we're gonna wait and hope the best but what i was asking me all the this this time was skyline one was released 2010 and beyond skyline was released at the end of 2017 in the united states and in the beginning of 2018 in germany why uh, did it take so long to make the second movie didn't it get a uh, green lighted was there other problems yeah i mean i touched on a little bit of what some of the problems were but um one is the first movie had such a negative reaction that everyone kind of like tucked into their shells and did other stuff for two years. Um, so, you know, it was like, so to, it's the end of 2010. So 2011, you know, we made, we worked on this, um, the found footage movie. Uh, I, I wrote another script. I, I rewrote the, the black hole script and we were, we were trying to get that made 2012. Um, we were working with Alec Gillis on a project that we wanted to do that was like a safari to an alien planet. And we put a lot of time into that over the next two years. So it was really around 2013 that um, we had one of the early Netflix deals um, on for, for Skyline, where it skipped HBO or any of the other TV things after, and it went right mm -hmm. to, to early Netflix. Um, and that lasted for almost two and a half years or something. So 2013, it showed up on like Spike TV and um, Sci-Fi Channel and stuff and doing its TV run. And when I saw that, I was like, I'm going to, you know, I I'll watch it on on uh, Twitter and, and talk with people about it. And when I watched it again on TV, I felt like it was better. I felt like um, broken up by like commercial breaks. It just kind of fit, you know, because like a lot of a lot of my favorite horror movies, my parents didn't let me watch R-rated movies when I was a kid. So I would watch them on like um, TV. You know, I, that's how I would. That's how I saw Alien. That's how I saw The Thing um, with all the, the gory parts edited out. Um, yeah. So I felt like, you know, because Skyline's not really a gory movie anyway, but just seeing it as like kind of a, a Saturday matinee on TV felt perfect in a weird way. Even the, like, so I, I, after seeing it, I was like, man, you know, I just, I'd kill to make the sequel to this. And we had already had the sequel treatment kicking around. People would ask about it every couple of months, but like, it, it was almost like, it's like a chicken or the egg where they say like, um, no. oh, we're interested in it, but they didn't want to give money for us to write the script. They just wanted it to happen. So I kind of realized around 2013 that if I didn't just write the script, then it was never going to really happen. So that was my kind of um, the light bulb after seeing it on, 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 on cable. And I said to the brothers, you know, I'll write the script. So we just have a script, but I, if I do that, I really want to direct it. And um, they said, yeah, sure. Go ahead. And so then, you know, wrote the script. I feel like I got pulled into something else at the end of the year after I did the first draft, which was an insane first draft. It was huge. Um, and then, the next year uh, really kind of clamped down on it and made it what it was going to be. And they brought it to Cannes in 2014 for funding and it ended up selling really well. So then it was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta cast this thing. And I really want, I wrote it for Frank Grillo. I, I loved him in warrior. And I felt like oh, that, you was, did. that was the perfect, you know, character that felt like he was the perfect actor for this character. Um, and so, you know, we ended up getting him in the, at the, in September, I say 2014. And then it was like, he has to go and he has to shoot in December. So that ended up kicking everything up that we, I think we ended up shooting earlier than, um, we probably normally would have. And then it was like weaving around his schedule for the next six months. So we, we started shooting December, 2014, we finished May, 2015. So a very long production. And then we ended up finishing, um, you know, we, we, we had something like 1700 visual effects shots. So we're working on that wow. and we didn't really have the financing to do that many visual effects shots, but hydraulics is the owner and the producer of the film. So it was almost like we would work on it and then kind of take these hiatuses 
and then kind of reconvene when all the visual effects were done because you're, you're editing green screen without pre-vis, without post-vis. You kind of have to wait to see where things would be. So we ended up finishing a version of that movie um, about a year in three months after wrap. So like end of 2000, I'd say like September, 2016, October, 2016, we finished a version of the movie and we did a big test screening for it. And the test screening came back that it was like all the action and everything they thought was too long. And there was all these pacing issues. And the biggest thing was what is going on with this Rose girl? Um, so then we kind of, we brought in a, a different editor, Sean Albertson, who's a really, uh, he's, he's, he was kind of Stallone's go-to editor, uh, where he did Rambo four, he did Rocky Balboa. <laughs> um, and he was a great experience to work with. I actually really, really enjoyed him. And I learned a lot from him on, on pacing in general. Um, and so he basically just kind of s- really tightened the movie and okay. we, you know, before that, th- while we were doing that, it was coming up with this idea of how do how do we deal with this Rose character and a bunch of trial by error ideas on what the wraparounds would be. It felt like we nailed it. And then it was like, okay, who do we cast as this, as this adult Rose? And I was killing myself just kind of going through pictures on IMDb because I've got this little girl that we've already shot two years ago in Indonesia you know, with this dark hair and these big dark eyes and she right. look like her as an adult, but she also has to feel like to me, even though she's not Frank Grillo's daughter, she has to have that presence, <laughs> you know, to feel like she's part of the movie. Um, and so luckily um, I had seen the first season of the 100. And when her, when I, I looked at Lindsay's photo on IMDb, I was like, that, that's it. That's it. She's perfect. And I sent that to the brothers and they were like, yeah, she's, she's, she's awesome. They'd never seen her before, but they, her, her stuff before, but they, they obviously liked her look. And um, so we reached out to her, uh, her reps and it, you know, it's, we already had like a trailer for like this finished movie. So it's like, here's this trailer for this Frank Grillo movie. And she's a huge Frank Grillo fan. Do you want to be in it? And it was like, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and you only have to film for one day and here's the, here are the sides. And so she came in um, and she was actually friends with our DP, Chris, Christopher Probst, who shot her first movie, Detention. Uh, and we shot for one day at Hydraulics. We had built this like total handmade set out of steel. Um, uh, uh, oh my God, my brain's not working. Like steel platforms. And we put a bunch of bullshit on the inside of them to create this corridor. And then it was, um, you know, this med lab in the green screen. So that was all one day. And I was like, oh, this, this, this girl's awesome. Like she, she can do everything. She's, you know, she looks like she's dying at the beginning. And then she had this really quiet moment. And then she kind of got up and commanded the room. And I loved her rapport with, uh, with Trent. And now we end this movie on this big, it was almost like, okay, if we're going to do this reshoot and we're going to add this extra thing to the movie, I wanted to add like an extra genre because it had already yeah. such a big, huge behemoth of genre mashing. So I was like, we're going to fucking end on like just Star Wars, you know, ships exploding. Um, and so I pitched that to them. They're just like, ah. So again, like that that end shot, I think there was like 60 versions of that comp. It was, again, not, not making anything easy on myself. Um, but yeah, so that whole movie, we finished it, I would say, you know, so we, we shot in... February, 2017. And then the movie was done in summer of 2017, but vertical wanted to release it in December. So okay. from the beginning of shooting in December, 2014 to then finishing mid 2017. So it was a two and a half year process. Oh, and, uh, that's a long that's, time. Part of that's yeah. Just the nature of the beast. Part of that's the budget of not really having the money to make something that big. So you kind of need time. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, uh, do you want it like good, cheap or fast? And it's like, you know, pick two. And so we, we did, we did good and cheap, but it was definitely not fast. Um, well, you definitely did because I really liked the movie. It's uh, one of the 
better sci-fi movies those last year because there were obviously those masterpieces. You got Blade Runner from oh, yeah, from yeah, Denis yeah. Villeneuve. I don't even think those are you the same. Those, those aren't the same genre. You know, that's like, uh, what I was talking about. You got those uh, movies, those yeah, masterpieces, yeah, yeah. but those are not action movies. This no. is a different kind of science fiction. And with Beyond Skyline, you got an action science fiction movie, if you ask me, a completely different movie, like you say. And that's what I love about this because there aren't that many no, good yeah. science fiction action movies. And ours are kind of like, like from the beginning, these are very much sort of like, um, you know, like we wear our references on our sleeves. They're sort of like, you know, like, like the first one is very much, you know, Independence Day, um, you know, with Night of the Living Dead, uh, you know, w w with uh, flavors of District 9 and stuff like that. Like it's never... It, it, they've never been pretentious to me. Um, I think some people misread the first movie as like being too serious. And mm -hmm. um, it, it did get a little self-serious at times, but it still was like, we were fucking having a blast, having fun on that movie. And we kind of, we knew what it was, which was sort of a throwback to like a 1950s movie, um, invasion movie which is even like some of the artwork in the movie. It's like spiders from Mars and it has all, the, it, it's very, it's very much kind of a throwback. And then in, in Beyond Skyline, it's like, it, it's a definite eighties action movie throwback. It was pretty much like, what if, you know, John McClane was in an alien invasion was sort of the, the whole big question of it. And then we lucked into getting, you know, Eco and Yaya in it. So the back half became this whole other thing where it was like, it, it was originally kind of more of an apocalypse now, Vietnam War film at the end. It all of a sudden morphed into that plus, you know, the raid versus alien. So um, this new one is is definitely, it, it's, 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 I'd th say it's even the least pretentious of them in that we're kind of fully embracing, you know, aliens, Starship Troopers, Pitch Black, Chronicles of Riddick um and, and kind of having fun with with all of that stuff so it's like that that's why when it, i just don't put us in i it's like we're what i love about it is that i do feel like we're in this weird little niche where it's like it's not like this fully campy hokey you know um asylum type thing and it's not <laughs> yeah i know what you mean huge, big budget movies it's like we're earnest we 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 love the movies we love the characters we take them seriously but there's a sense of play and fun about it and that like it's not fucking blade runner 2049 like we know it's not it's not a masterpiece it's it a, shouldn't be it shouldn't be that movie it's a saturday morning matinee you know it's a saturday matinee movie that's that's really what they they want to be which is what is interesting to me about some people's reactions to them because some people want them to be like super like serious and they get really mad that there's a sense of playfulness to it. And I always, it, you know, it's helpful to me because, you know, you can't help but take criticism to heart. You can't help but, but feel, um, you know, you're, you're the, my entire job is quite literally to be a critic in a weird way of myself. You know, I sit behind a monitor and I criticize every take and then I sit, in a seat looking at all those takes and criticize every single edit to make it to what I want to be. So like the critical thinking is part of the job. It, it literally is the number one part of the job is that like, I'm not an expert in movie making. I'm an expert <clears throat> in my movie. So I'm, right. I'm the expert in skylines. I'm an expert in beyond skylines. So like, I know what that movie is more than anybody else. That's, that's all my job is, is to know that, um, as better than anybody else. So when you hear these different things, but to me, what I, I love hearing when, when I hear someone that doesn't like the movie, when they'll say like, and then they put bloopers at the end and ruined it to me, I can go, Oh, I don't like you. I don't like that person. I will never agree with you on anything. So I yeah. don't care what your review is because like, if you don't like the bloopers at the end, then like, I just, I, I don't like you. I don't like your opinion. You don't seem like a fun person to be around. And I can kind of just let the negative criticism kind of roll off my back at that point. Cause then I'm like, uh, you were never going to be happy because I was always going to put these bloopers at the end. Cause that's to me, what was so fun about these movies is, 
is having that sort of curtain call, that spirit and that playfulness. So yeah, it's, it's been sort of like, it, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird experience. Um, you know, because I felt like the second movie surprised so many people that the, the critical reactions were quite good. And we had such kind of low expectations that it was like, people were like, Oh my God, this is actually really good. But what was sort of annoying about it was that people would always kind of temper their enthusiasm. They'd be like, it's a really fun, dumb movie. Um, you know, like it's surprisingly entertaining for how stupid it is. And they can't kind of just say like, did you enjoy the movie or not? Like, you know, and so that, that kind of stuck in my craw on, on beyond skylines reaction. Whereas now three years later, I don't hear that as much. I definitely hear more people being like, this is one of the best, you know, uh, VOD DTV sequels of a movie ever. And it kind of goes way above and beyond anything you would ever expect um, from, from where it came from. And what I liked about the reactions to Skylines is that the people that did love it um, didn't say it's so stupid, you have to turn your brain off. They actually were just coming out and saying, I really love this movie. It's one of the best, you know, sci-fi action movies of the year. And so that's what I was reading. So that so that's been sort of this strange evolution where I can feel like people, it's almost like because you have a series and because they exist on these things that no movie is its own like. It doesn't have the same burden anymore. And it, cause it kind of spreads out. Like even the first movie, some of the negative reactions for it was because it ended so sudden and it didn't feel like it had this conclusion, but now the sequels have freed it from that burden. And now it's got yeah. this really great. Like it sets this sets the table for like this really wild ride that goes to places you'd never expect. So people are much more forgiving of it. So Yeah, it's just been this interesting thing where you you live with the movies over 10 years and you see how different things land with people. And um, yeah, it, it kind of fires me up to just keep making them, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, as I said, I really enjoyed the second part. And um, well, I already told you I'm a little bit... Uh, disappointed that there are no collectibles for that movie. I would spend more money on Beyond Skyline if I could, okay. but we'll I can't. And so <laughs> here we go. Oh my God. This is is a, that this is, is so the, awesome. This is the exact same claw that Frank Grillo and Nico have in Beyond Skyline. And then uh, Lindsay Morgan has in Skylines. And it was repainted and refurbished by Fito from Crete uh, effects out of Spain for Skylines. because I had this basically in my, um, in my attic, like I do now after beyond skyline, I brought it to Lithuania in a suitcase. Okay. <laughs> And I didn't know why it was kind of like, because it wasn't in the script at that point. The only thing in the okay. script for skylines was this one. God, this is awesome. This is roses. The red one. This is Rose's new claw, which was in the script. And okay. I was the at the end of uh, which this one has a uh, a plasma cannon attached to mm -hmm. it, so she can kind of do her alien weaponry blasting while she's fighting. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 old claw I brought. I didn't really know why I brought it. Um, other than just to have for inspiration and then um, without giving too much away of the end of Skylines it felt like her end fight needed something a little bit extra special to it and so we, 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 we managed to find a little trick to get her that claw and uh, she has that uh, for the end fight and, and, and it ended up being of course like part of all the marketing in this one and stuff. So one of those, one of those kind of like happy accidents, but uh, good, good instinct to bring it with me. Um, what I wanted to, wanted to ask you, I will watch the, the trailer for part three for skylines. And I don't know if I'm right about this, but it looks a little bit darker and gloomy compared to beyond skyline. 
Is that the case? Is part three a little bit darker from uh, the tone? Not no. It's it's mainly that um, the you know the alien planet is you know we 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 shot a lot of location on uh, on Beyond, so you have a lot of you know sun sunlight exteriors, and I think a lot of you know uh, cobalt was it, it's an alien set. So we were able to kind of control mm -hmm. the lighting more and make it moodier and, and darker in those sets. But I would say color wise, they're fairly similar. They're both very, very colorful. Um, I think actually Skylines is, ends up being more colorful. It's, it's um, because our, uh, you know, we have a French DP, uh, there's a lot of more, Uh, embracing different colors, I think in in uh, okay. this one, there's a lot more reds and purples and um, neons. Um, there's a definite, there's a whole like neon lit sequence. Um, and then, you know, our our Earth plot is uh, is is daylight exteriors too, so you have that. Um, uh, but no, I I think aesthetically, there's there's fairly similar, except that the big change is that it, it's a totally different genre you know like there's not it really is. any moment in there's not really any moment in skyline or even beyond skyline where the movie like stops and really asks you to pay attention there's the <laughs> one scene in beyond skyline where they they get into the um the bunker and uh callan mulvey's character is starting to explain to them you know, the light and the virus and stuff. And that was actually the, I think one of the only scenes, the, those sequences are one of the only scenes shot on a dolly in beyond skyline. So much more, so much of it was sort of handheld um, in, in steady cam. So that's one of those scenes, like you're on a dolly, everybody gather around, pay attention to the class. But I think it's like, it's literally two minutes long. Whereas the opening of skylines, you know, I'd say it's, There's there's action right away. There's there's a big space oh, okay. battle. There's a big space battle. You know. Then we have you know a, a fight scenes, and then we have a bunch of sci-fi traveling through wormholes. But there's more kind of like traditional. Like you have a mission. Everybody has to sit around and actually explain. You know, a story to you. It feels a little bit more like a Star Trek Aliens plot, where you have to kind of like. <sighs> get a bunch of fucking jib, like sci-fi exposition to everybody and get put on this mission. So that's the other thing is that like each movie is we, we, we completely kind of do a different genre. And uh, I, I, to me that, that helps keep things fresh. It helps me grow, I think as a filmmaker and get to try new things and not just keep making, you know, people trapped in an apartment which, you know, yeah. would, would have been the easiest thing in the world to do. We could have just done apartments around the world for each fucking chapter. It's <laughs> like, oh, this is, this is what it's like in Berlin. And here's what it was like in Tokyo. Um, and I, I just, I had no interest in doing that. And I didn't even really, to me, it was like the story um, after Beyond, if we had kind of stayed in the like right after that, in that war time, it felt like it wasn't going to be enough to get it made. I felt like because, you know, in a lot of ways, this could have ended after beyond, you know, that it was such a big ending, the space blast and it goes over camera. Like I would have been happy if that was, that was it. That was the ending. I felt like part three had to be such a bold kind of idea that like the, the concept itself was sort of the star. They're like, no, 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 we're actually going to the alien planet. And um and and I felt like by by being that sort of bold with the with the concept for part three, it was like just so crazy that it could actually work and actually get attention and get made because you get, you know, you're in competition with all these different ideas and all these different things for financing. Um, so I just had this instinct that like we had to go really big or else people would just ignore it. And if it was just beyond skyline two, then it, that wasn't going to be enough. Um, so, so yeah, this, this one, what I, what I love about it is that it is sort of like a complete change of pace. It does all these other things, but if you've been paying attention to the series all the way through, you know, there's a lot of touchstones and where we could go from here 
um, would be really quite interesting. Cause I feel like now I've created like the sandbox for what, you know, mm. it, is its own unique world. It's not like, okay. it's like an invasion, an invasion world, like the beyond skyline world or the skyline world. It's just, it's just a post evasion world. It's just people running helter skelter. But now with a post-apocalyptic world where aliens and humans are living together um, and having relations and, and, and trying to figure out peace and, and, and all those things that to me is we we're, we're now in a much more interesting place to me, at least. It is. And um, after reading what part three is about, I got really excited because Skylines is giving me what I wanted from Independence Day 3. Because at the end of uh, Independence uh, Day 2, they telling, OK, we're going to the alien world and the movie never came. But now it could Skylines. still come. I mean, think about how long people uh, say that a lot, but think of how long the time was between Independence Day and Independence Day 2. Um, but it's funny. A lot of people say that. A lot of people say it about um, Pacific Rim as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think Independence Day 2 came out while I was in post for Beyond. And I was like, I actually liked it quite a bit. A lot of people, um, you know, just were, a bit <laughs> were, weren't happy with it. I, lo- I, I thought the queen, the queen alien that they had was was really cool. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting though, like, and then, and the stuff they did on the alien ship in that was like, you know, budget wise was just blows everything that we do. I was just like, Whoa, this looks insane. Um, so, but yeah, it, it was interesting because if you think about it, like they, they went into the alien ship in the first independence day and they go into the alien ship in the second one. And it's like, they, you know, the alien planet's going to be fairly similar to those scenes, but there's this tantalizing aspect of just really, you know, what they could do on their scale is so different than what we're doing. But what I really right. like is that, um, you know, I, I feel like the movie that we made fulfills the promise of what it says it was going to be. And, um, and so, yeah, I was, uh, it, it's funny. It's funny that, um, you know, we made this little movie, you know, what, uh, 12 years after Independence Day came out. Was Independence Day 97, 13 years? I think it was uh, seven. Yeah. And then, so we did that in 2010, 13 years, and it was obviously inspired by it. And then, like, we've made a third one, and and, and there isn't a third Independence Day. It is pretty funny. It is it's crazy, funny. but, but they, they that's the world we live in. If they wanted to make something, you know, they could. It would, it'll it'll probably happen. There's like, there's no, you're never get like, we'll never, we'll die before the last star Wars movie is made. We're never going to see the end of these things. And I I finally came to peace with that this year where you're just like, Oh, it's just going to always keep going. There's nothing. There'll be no end. Uh, You know, it is what it is. It is what it is. But uh, as I said, I'm really excited for part three because it gives me something I love to see, but don't get to see very much. Not in Hollywood, no, not on no, the independent so scene. I agree with you. And I think this is because we actually love the genre. But when you like you read some of the negative reviews, they they make it sound like people have been making an aliens riff every year for the past 34 years. There hasn't been that many movies. Like no. there, there hasn't been that many space marine mission movies. When I was looking at references, I'm like, so you got a movie from 1986, which is a masterpiece. And then you got a movie from 1997 with uh, Starship Troopers. And then Pitch Black's not a space mission movie, but like that's 2000. It, it's 2020. Like there's just not that many of them. And if they are, they're very, very low budget. So they can't really do what you want to do. So I, I, to me, I felt like it was underserved as a genre. Like It and, is true. And, and that everyone's being like, oh, it's, there's nothing new to it. There's not enough similar. It's like, there's not enough of them. There needs to be more of them that you guys make a coming of age college movies every fucking year. And yeah. like, <laughs> no one's going to alien planets and shooting <laughs> aliens in the head. Like what? Yeah. Like, it's so, I don't know. I, I, I feel passionate about it too, where I'm just kind of like, I, 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 I feel like, you know, there just hasn't been that many uh, of these things. And it, it was one of the things in, in AVP two that was frustrating to me that it was like, 
you, you know, okay, you made the first alien versus predator on earth. And then you have this pred alien takeoff in the ship. Like, let's go into space. It's such a perfect place for part two to go. And it was like, no, yeah. no, it's going to crash back down. And, and then we're going to go into a, uh, you know, a high school gymnasium. And you're like, this is just not what anyone wants to see. We want, you know, space Marines. We want, um, alien science fiction. Yeah, that's what we want. Exactly. So, so to me that that's that it's scratching this itch that I, that I wanted to do from the, the, the first movie I ever got to work on, you know, especially in AVP two, you get a short scene from the predator on his planet and, uh, you're sitting there and thinking, Yes, show me more of this. I want to be here. I want to see this. Give it to me. That But wasn't, no, that wasn't cut. even in. That wasn't even in the movie. That was that was something we fought for to add because we were like, we don't have anything cool. That's like, you know, they they just had. I think in the script, the the predator sh just showed up, and so okay. we were like, we want to do like the predator planet, and for it to even be as big as it is. Had to oh, get a bunch man. of clearances for them to spend the extra money on those VFX, but yeah, that was an awesome scene. I gotta tell you, it. yeah, I mean, yeah, if it you is cut, true. If you cut everything with the with the wolf together, you have like a 10 to 15 minute like really awesome predator story. And like you yeah. just like that was my experience the last time I watched it. I was like, oh, the, like all the predator storytelling is really really cool. And they did the visual storytelling on him is, is really well done, which is hard because he's not, it's not like he's not saying anything. There's no dialogue. Um, it was actually one of the things I didn't quite like in, in the latest, the predator was that they had him like using like Google voice apps. And I was like, well, that kind of like breaks the rules of like the visual storytelling of the predator, like the, the, the predator, you have to tell the story visually. Yeah. Um, Which, you know, I, maybe I'm a hypocrite because I actually have the the aliens speaking in part three, but it they're 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 more like human characters. They're more like Star Trek characters in part three. Interesting. Uh, when they're part of the group. So I felt like it was a different genre at that point. But when they're still like an invader and like they're an unknowable thing, it feels like you kind of need to, you know, keep that. Like I love John McTernan's visual style in the first Predator of just you know the camera's always kind of roving up over his shoulder, and and onto what he's doing and his actions are telling you his intentions the whole time. We tried to right. do that in Beyond Skyline with the Shepherd and the holograms. You know the holograms became, you know like it's like the camera's coming over her shoulder to her hand, coming around seeing the holograms. It's like her reactions to all those things were pure visual storytelling we had no real other cheats to let you know what you're <laughs> thinking or or feeling in any in any given scene so it was all povs holograms and reaction shots yeah and uh, as i said i'm very excited for the next uh, part of skylines because it's uh, that uh, different kind but i would like to ask you uh, about part three um How do I say this? <laughs> um, <clears throat> would there is there an option for a skyline series? Because the world obviously is big. You created a big alien world. You're going to the planet of the aliens. There is so much to tell, and series are the big thing today, right? On Netflix, Amazon Prime, you got series after series and you only did movies so far if i'm not mistaken yeah. right yeah. is a series a skyline series something you would be interested in or do you want to stay with the movies uh, person I, i actually would I, i prefer the movies to be honest but um obviously if if someone came to me and said do you want to do a series you know i'd jump at it but um i think just from like It would have to be, it, it would have to be something where the, that that it economically makes sense because we're like maximizing, you know, everything <laughs> for these the the budgets of these movies. And I'd be mm -hmm. worried if we did it as a series that it would just be too cheap, uh, and, yeah. and we, we would be stretched too thin. But um, if if they they came in with enough funding that um, that we could make it. Um, look as good as the films, you know, or, or, or something similar. Then, then I, I would, I would jump at it. 
but I do kind of like, it's like, I don't know. It's like, because the, from where I feel like they're, they're heading towards is a little bit more, um, you know, I, I feel like I was, the, the, the movies were originally very spectacle driven in, in like, like alien character driven. And what I feel like with the last two, where we're getting is that like the, the human characters are, are becoming, or, or Trent, the alien character and Rose are becoming the most important things, you know, rightfully so, and the biggest draws. And so to me, it, it kind of is like a series, but it's, it's stretched out over these movies. Um, right. So the next movie, if we were to do a part four, would be kind of the closest to an actual sequel that we've ever done. You know, it'd be the okay. closest to like more of a direct sequel because each one's been sort of a jump. So if we were to do part four, it's almost like like Fast and the Furious in a way where it's like, you know, the, the they had these different casts and then you kind of bring the cast together. And, yeah. you know, what with what happened in that sweet spot of like Fast Five, Fast Six, Fast Seven is that like those that is kind of a TV series stretched out over like three or four movies where it's very soap opera, like the actual plots in, in the story for those movies, it's more about spending time with the characters. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could see it kind of from both ways, but I, for me, I guess it's like what I know how to do and what I know how to get made is like, is the films. And, um, you know, so that's kind of where I'm focused until someone else kind of can, you know, makes us some sort of offer or interest into doing the series. But to me, I feel like uh, to do a part four and, and bring together the, the, the cast would be uh -huh. a really exciting uh, thing to do. And, and kind of like that could set things up and, 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 and change things. But yeah, we've, we've talked about a series. We talked about doing a series in the period um, of, post beyond skyline you know where okay with frank and and a young rose um and and i did like a a fleshed out an outline for for something there but it's it's just kind of like I, it's not it's not the world that i've been in for the past 15 years you know i've been in the feature world and um and so that that's still kind of where my focus is and if uh if it works great but yeah, it is it is an interesting thing where I do see it seems like TV just has such a huge pull over people and they get so attached to the actors. I mean, that's one of the interesting things uh, working with Lindsay Morgan for in, in Beyond and Skylines is like her her fan base from the 100 is so crazy and so yeah. dedicated. And, the the you know, they're they're so kind of attached to that character in a way that is uh, is really unique. Yeah, the, I didn't see the series, got to say, but I read but about a, it. It's a similar thing of what you're asking, you know. But yeah, uh, it's popular, very yeah. popular. I hear yeah. about it many times. Yeah. The series. So, yeah, it, it's, I, I definitely wouldn't say no, but, um, you know, I'm writing part four right now and I'm, I'm focused on that. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> part four, that... Uh, really warms my heart to hear that because <laughs> I'm a big supporter of you and your movies. I guess you know that after the, yeah. those years <laughs> yeah. and I will continue this support. I still got a few short questions. Okay. And um, one you already answered. Part four is one of your next projects, I think. So I don't have to ask what I mean, you're I'm doing next. It, I'm writing it, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, the, the other next project that I'm trying to get made this year because uh, the script's already been written by by a, a really great writer, um, Braggy Shoot, is uh, Abomination, which is uh, an Arctic creature survival horror type movie that I'd so love to see. Think. The Thing, but like meets Jaws. So it's definitely, okay. you know, it's definitely, um, you know, men on a mission trying to kill a big beast. Um, so it, it's a little bit more uh, mature and... Uh, in period uh, piece for anything I've done, but you know, they'll still be like creatures ripping human beings apart. So you yeah. kind of <laughs> sounds good to me. <laughs> you can kind of see why uh, uh, I, I would do it, I guess. Um, 
it's a, it seems like it, it would be a, a really interesting challenge. And um, I'm, I'm definitely afraid of the cold and uh, I hate the cold. So it feels like uh, something I should, I should face and, uh, and oh, make, yeah. make a real fun sort of like you're saying, like there's like, I don't know. Some, some people say there's, uh, there's a lot of movies like this, but I feel like if you're an actual fan, there's not, there's not enough, there's not enough of the movies that we love and you can kind of watch every great creature movie in a month and you're kind of left wanting more. So I just want to keep, um, you know, building off of that legacy and making more and more, uh, fun, um, gnarly creature films. Very excited to hear that because I love that creative, creative stuff on the big, on the screen, because as you say it, yeah, all those other movies you see every week, every month, you've seen them multiple times. Give us something fresh, something new. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. The new yes. creature feature. Yeah. Very yeah. excited. And I, and That's I, and if there's just certain people that are like ashamed to actually make creature features instead of like embrace what a creature feature is, which is like, guess what? Jurassic Park's a fucking creature feature, you know, like, you know, yeah. you can dress it up in as much and as, and as, as prestige clothing as clothing as you want, but you know, Jaws, Jurassic Park, they're, they're, they're two of my favorite creature features. So, you know, like, you know, we we're just trying to like, to me, I, I just, I, I try to like just strip the pretension out of things and, and, and make them, you know, as close to what I want to see as possible. Yeah. Good, good. Nice to hear. So very excited for your next project. This question is from a friend of mine. I told him that I'm going to talk to you, told him what movies you made. And he uh, told me to ask you about the biggest vision you have. If you got all the money in the world, no matter the actors, what kind of movie would you make? Because we, we're going to see Tom Cruise go to the space, make a movie there. We see... 3D movies those last few years. What is this big movie vision you have for the future you would love to make if you had the opportunity? It's interesting. I feel like that was something that uh, drove me quite a bit in the beginning. You know, like when I said the first script I wrote was a black hole on earth. I mean, mm -hmm. it literally, it was about CERN, you know, particle accelerators And they created not only a black hole, but the actual big crunch of the entire universe <laughs> collapsed in on itself. And Earth, because that's where we created the black hole, was the point of origin. So it was like people were looking up into the sky and seeing like the, a wall of stars come towards the planet, which, uh, you know, so it was like a lot of amazing, huge uh, imagery that that was the first thing that uh, that I wrote. But the script was it was very green. But there was there was always something to me about the big crunch. Just I remember seeing that, um, which now I think isn't even the predominant theory of how the universe would end. But at the time, where, you know, I'm 38. I think it was like uh, you know 10 or 11 in science class, and they had like a a, a drawing of what the big crunch would be. I was like, ah, oh, you know, I've always wanted to do a movie about uh, you know the actual universe collapsing. Uh, universe, the beginning of it would have was the Big Bang, and then like you know, which went into the Oppenheimer test, um, of the new, the, the nuclear bomb. And then the end of the movie was the actual big crunch that then went into another big bang and then went blah, blah, blah. So it was like, you know, I, I was so obsessed with spectacle and kind of, um, you know, grand gestures starting out. But I, I honestly think the movie that if I had any budget, uh, unlimited budget to make right now would just be, um, the last savage, which is something I wrote. And then, um, um, Derek Kolstad, who wrote the John Wick films and, and the Nobody mm -hmm. movie with um, Bob Odenkirk, uh, rewrote the script with me uh, a year or so ago. And it's, it's not a huge budget, but it's sort of a, a cyberpunk, post-apocalyptic uh -huh. martial arts um, tournament movie, you know, set in Asia. And, you know, it reads like it's probably $80 million, dollars, but I feel like we could do it for, you know, a quarter of that price, if le if not less. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd be much more, that to me is much more of a dream project, um, because I like literally practically know how to make it and I could 
I could just, just by getting in prep right now, like today could start going about building the plans to do it uh, and would, would just have so much fun doing that. So it's not so much about uh, as much as the big crunch would, if anyone wanted to make that movie, I would jump at it in a second. It's less to me about those grand um, spectacle gestures and more about like the most compelling characters and worlds. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of, that, that's a very fun question though. Uh, you tell your friend, I think that's, that's a, that's a good one. I think you should do that for every interview you do. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do it again. If I got the opportunity, maybe yeah. after I've seen skylines, we can yeah. talk again in a few months. Sounds but good. Yeah. That is, is it one last question I have. Mm -hmm. That's uh, more of a personal thing because a big part of uh, those last years in my life was hashtag rele release the Snyder Cut because I guess you know what's going oh, oh, what's yeah, going yeah. on there. Oh yeah. And um, I asked myself, is there any uh, sort of director's cut for your movies? Is there a lot of are there a lot of scenes somewhere hidden that we didn't get to see, or is you can basically say everything in the movie that you got to show. Very interesting. Um, I mean, there's definitely the, 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 the Snyder cut thing was, it was a real tragedy and uh, that, that, you know, it was a horrible situation with his family. Um, but no, nothing, nothing like that. Um, Beyond Skyline was, it was in post for so long that I tried so many different things and worked so hard on it that there's like no real hesitation or anything to change anything on that movie. The only thing that I look at it, like if I were to redo the movie now is I probably, um, if I were making that movie now and I saw what was happening in, when we were in Indonesia, I would have tried to rewrite it more on the fly and have that part be longer and then have like, Trent get taken onto the ship in downtown LA and get rid of the subway tunnel stuff so that it okay. would be like, they, they get pulled onto the ship, like, you know, within the first 15 minutes and they're crashing into Asia at the 30 minute mark rather than the hour mark. I would have tried to do something like that. I think because, um, you know, it was, it was, it was really fun for us to have this first act that coincided with the, with the first movie And that the aerial battle and all those things were all kind of like connecting together. But as a movie, it made it disjointed for some people, but it doesn't keep me up at night. Like I, I, I love the movie. I'm glad with how it worked out. And it's such a unique um, kitchen sink experience. And it's like one of those things where it's like, if people don't like it, I just generally don't like them. So I'm, I don't really have anything. The, the, the issues I have with skylines are, Because we finished it in this pandemic, um, I felt like I, I, I almost, there's like one last pass of like, of even, even there's this thing that really annoys me with the movie is the runtime. It's only two minutes longer than Beyond Skyline. Beyond Skyline's okay. run, runtime is, uh, is 107 minutes. Um, with the actual movie is 100 minutes and it has seven minutes of credits. So, Skylines is 102 minutes, but the listed runtime is 113 minutes. So it has 11 yeah. minutes of credits. Uh, part of it is contractual obligations for the end on mains with our bloopers is just longer because we had so many different producers. So that's like a three minute blooper reel. And then the end credits is seven minutes, which I feel like they might've like put the, the scroll in like super slow mode. Because I just have no idea why it's so long because the crew is not any bigger than a normal movie. And then we okay. have like a minute of pre uh, of pre cut. So th that is like a real like OCD thing that just bothers me. But because it was like finished in such a crunch, I didn't quite like try to, to it, it shouldn't be, it should only be 150 minutes runtime. And I still feel like there's maybe 30 seconds to a minute of just like air that I could sap out of the movie to make it a little, a little uh, zinger. But no, when I watched it again, there weren't any like changes or, 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 or scenes that I would do different. Oh, I I've added deleted scenes to the um, Blu-ray to that one as well. 
and okay. they're, all, they're all like just kind of totally fine deleted scenes you know things that would be if we had an unlimited budget there's a lot more action that we've shot um that i know you know broke you know you know D- daniel bernhardt like murdering aliens there's a ton more of it but every single shot was a visual effect shot and okay. uh so we we had to be quite um you know judicious with it and um there's there was already you know quite a quite a lot of visual effects in the movie and the my only other big regret on skylines was there was we we were going to go to grand canaria um spain you know which is off the coast of africa to do some exteriors and it wasn't a lot it was just like three scenes and it was going to be a lot of money and a lot of headache to do it and i knew we could do the scenes on the sets with a little uh but it's one of those things where i think what might have been what 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 how would that have visually changed certain things um to be interesting and i'll never know but i feel like that was also because of how hard beyond skyline was that i was like i'm not i i I had like ptsd about doing that again because you know like on the scout in Grand Canaria with these amazing locations, they're very, very hard to get to. There could be flash flooding, which that type of stuff happened in Indonesia all the time. But I think if I were to do it over again, I would, I would say, roll the dice. Let's try to get these three scenes on location so that we have more visual variants in the movie. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's anything really editorially um, from the two movies that I'd do any different. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it's definitely not a situation where anyone took them over and, and changed what I wanted to do. You know, like when Sean, know. when Sean Albertson came on beyond skyline and did, you know, a recut of it, there was, I, I he was like, he was, he was wary of me at the beginning. And I was like, we're, we're, we're going to finish this movie. Don't worry. And he was like, okay. And he was doing everything he wanted to do. And I just kept pushing things back, kept pushing things back. <laughs> And like, like, cause he, he tried to cut out the eco um, throat stab fight, you know, cause you could see no. how editorially you don't really need it. You know, you could totally come down on them. They see the ship crash and they just, yeah. the edge. you could totally cut it out. And it, it actually, you know, pacing wise worked really well, but I was like, who's this movie for? Like we're, we're, we're putting this. So I got it. I cut it down and had it shorter, shorter, shorter. And then it was like, oh, yeah, it kind of works. Let's put it in. And uh, so, yeah, there's everything that I wanted that I really, really wanted in on, on beyond was in the bigger kind of crazier stuff that I uh, wanted on skylines, like got removed from the script stage. So there was never anything that we like really shot that uh, movie other than just more kills. So yeah, it'd be fun to have more, more alien kills in the movie. It'd be fun to be, more R rated because the movie was, I, I, I had to say that we were shooting for a PG 13 and I got them to, mm-hmm. you know, compromise with me that they would let me do an R rated cut. And then they would release, you know, on the Blu-ray, the PG 13 version, and then an unrated version. And then when I submitted yeah. the movie, they just said they liked the R rated version. And, and that's the movie that exists. So but I think well, if, I, if I had known that from the beginning, I would have, I think, I think skylines would have been gorier, but I, I think that was maybe just them, you know, trying to rein me in from beyond skyline that they were just kind of like make them do a PG 13 and then we'll end up getting like an R and not something so crazy like last time. So maybe, maybe it was all just a Jedi mind trick. Well, maybe we'll see it in the future. Who knows, Who knows? what we can expect. Yeah. But, um, so far, that's uh, all questions I had. So you, I would like to thank you very, very much that you took the time. I w- really appreciate it. I'm a big fan. As you know, I will support you the next few years. Uh, all the movies that are come, I will watch. I promise you. Oh, thank and you. And I hope that you get bigger budgets with the time because I think you're doing a pretty good job so far. And... That'd Hope to see much more from you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It was great talking to you. Thanks for the Thank awesome you. questions. Maybe we can do a spoiler talk after I see part three. I would love that. Absolutely. All right. So I wish you and your family the best for 2021. 
I'm very excited to talk again to you. And well, that's it for, from Germany. Have a good time. You too.